Four games in fall lingers in the sports fan's ear like a klaxon in the night. It was the punishment Tom Brady served for his role in Deflategate. This week's guest argues, however, that Brady, despite his iconic status, was not treated fairly or justly, and the reasons why matter to all of us. She's Julie Marin, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to a Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Selvia Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. We do that by visiting each week with the best contemporary storytellers, authors, scholars, filmmakers, and journalists, really anyone using or studying narrative to explain the world we live in. This week, we're joined by a talented filmmaker, Julie Marin, whose recent film, Four Games in Fall, explores the science and media manipulation at the heart of the so-called deflate gate scandal. Julie, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So uh, we want to talk about the movie. We want to talk about your work. But let's take a step back for a second. Before you got into filmmaking, you were a management consultant. Correct. Talk to us about the transition. What led you from management consulting to filmmaking? Well, so I essentially see the, 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 the roles as being very, very similar. And it was a personal incident that actually transitioned me from management consulting to filmmaking. Uh, one of my good friends uh, actually developed breast cancer after years of mammogram screening. She was identified with stage four, very late stage metastatic breast cancer. Um, so that led us on a journey to explore you know, the role of mammograms, you know, why they fail, and they fail a large number of women. Um, and so it was essentially using the same skills as I would have used in my day job to actually do the analysis and put the story together for the documentary that we ended up producing on that topic. And that was uh, Happy Graham? Correct, correct. And, and so it was this personal experience with your friend that led to the making of that film? It was, right. Um, so what we discovered is that mammograms are actually ineffective for the 40% of women who are m most likely to develop invasive breast cancer. Um, it actually, so these are women with dense breast tissue. The mammogram is a, it's an x-ray and it doesn't see through the dense breast tissue. So it's very difficult to identify uh, invasive tumors in these women. So these are, these are the women that account for over 70% of invasive breast cancers. And for many of them, they're the women that end up dying. And what we discovered is that over 40 years of mammography screening, we have failed to reduce the rate of metastatic breast cancer in the U.S. So if you think about that, mm -hmm. that means that we're not catching those cancers that are most likely to kill women. So what, for those women in that category, what, what options do they have? Well, um, there have been over the past uh, several years some other technologies that were developed. There's also a very simple technology, which is ultrasound, mm -hmm. is actually more effective at identifying invasive breast cancers in these women. So more and more we're seeing that being utilized. Um, I interviewed uh, a, a radiologist who developed an automatic whole breast ultrasound machine, and that's become more common. Um, there are other technologies that were developed. I interviewed a, uh, a, an internist at the Mayo Clinic who developed a technology called molecular breast imaging, and that's been very effective. But in medicine, it takes a fairly long period of time to adopt new technologies sometimes, and in this instance, it was more a matter of informing women about the inefficacy of mammography. So I don't want to monopolize this too much, but I have a question. One, one more follow-up sure. on this. So, but so why choose documentary filmmaking as opposed to, you know, being with your friend and supporting your friend? Why why right. tell this story? Right. Well, we had done a tremendous amount of research. We had written papers. I had gone with her to, you know, she had lobby days at the state house to get. Uh, legislation passed that would that would require radiologists to inform women if they had dense breast tissue and the mammogram didn't work, you know, as well as in other women. 
Um, and these are kind of very slow moving. You're not really hitting a lot of people at the same time. It takes a long time to get the word out. And with documentary filmmaking, it was a way for us to work together, at least initially, to really tell the story and to get that story out to more women so that they were informed about this, about this issue. Because essentially this is a major, it's an issue of informed consent in medicine. Women weren't being informed that they had dense breast tissue and the implications for that if they got mammograms. So did your film help change that dynamic, lead to a, a greater understanding and awareness that women could bring with them to, to, to their PCP or whatever I, doctor was treating them? I, I hope so. So there are a lot of women out there in various states trying to get legislation passed, and it's been an uphill battle. We kind of, um, we, we actually follow that a little bit in the state of California, like the difficulty in getting the legislation passed. So what we've done is we, that film, you know, went on the film festival circuit around the country. Uh, we won several awards with that. It's been used as a community education tool around the country and in other countries as well, in Europe and in Australia. So I'm hoping, you know, it takes some time, but I'm hoping that we're starting to get the word out. And that's just one, there are other women who are also working to get that word out and to get legislation passed. So your production company is called Lemon Martini Productions. Right. I, I want to I get into what you do, yes. <laughs> but I want to start with where did the name come from? It's hard what to get cocktail past was that? Right. <laughs> but seriously, where did yeah. the name come from? It's a great name, by oh, the way. Oh, thank you very much. People really respond to it, and they're yes. always, you know, in the bank. Oh, I wish I had one. Right, right, yeah. right, yeah. right, right. So that actually came about, um, so as I mentioned, my very dear friend Hallie um, developed metastatic breast cancer at a very young age, had had mammograms, and um, she had, you know, we were having this conversation. Her cousin had also had breast cancer, and she, we, we were talking about, you know, life hands you lemons, you got to make lemonade, and, and you know, I, I said to her, I was like, damn it, no, you got to make a lemon martini, <laughs> <laughs> forget the lemonade. So that's really, it was this conversation that I had with my friend that really led to that name. That's awesome. So your most recent production is Four Games in Fall, and the title is a reference that New England sports fans right. will certainly appreciate. Um, it's the it's the penalty meted out to Tom Brady and the New England Patriots for the deflate gate scandal. Um, we'll get to the specifics of that in a moment, but talk to us, why did you make this particular film? Yeah, this was really fascinating to me because I hadn't... I, I, I confess I'm not necessarily a football fan. I don't typically follow it very closely, but I was driving along with a friend of mine who had sports talk radio on. And uh, you know, it was, I was, my mind was, was getting numbed because I really, I don't typically follow these issues. But as I started to hear more and more about it and the way it was being presented in the media and the corporations and the individuals that were involved in uh, conducting the investigation and uh, uh, you know conducting the underlying experiments around these footballs, that to me was fascinating. And I thought, gosh, there's got to be a lot more to this story than we're hearing about in the media. And so I really started doing some research around it. And I thought, my gosh, this is a wonderful vehicle to discuss issues of media manipulation, science for hire, perversion of the legal system in a way that maybe we can draw in a broader audience who's you know, interested in football or Tom Brady. So that was really the motivation for doing this film. So, so back up for a second, just give us a synopsis of Deflategate for those who might never have heard of it, that'd be like three people. But just to, re <laughs> but just to refresh our memories. So uh, Deflategate uh, was this enormous scandal that erupted as a result of an AFC championship game in which the, the facts were alleged that, um, that uh, an opposing player, uh, an opposing uh, player, uh, the, the Patriots were playing, the Baltimore Ravens. yeah, the Raven, it, had intercepted this football, kind of squished it, felt a little bit squishy, went to the sidelines and said, hey, this football is squishy, should we do something about it? Um, and what happened is, um, the NFL determined, they had some referees go into the locker room, and they determined that the Patriots footballs were uh, lower in PSI than the allotted range, the allotted range which was 12.5 to 13.5. Um, this led to a whole series of investigations around the incident, and Tom Brady was fined in, it, the, the Patriots were fined, and Tom Brady actually had to serve four-game suspension. Um, 
it was fascinating to me how much time this, you know, alleged deflation of footballs took in the mainstream media. It wasn't just the sports talk radio. It was mainstream media. It led the nightly news. It led the nightly oh, news. You couldn't escape it. Yeah. You, and you still can't get away from it because now there's this movie out. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> well the, the movie is, is fascinating to me because it's an entry point. Sports is the entry point. Right. But you, this is really about much more than just the, the 12 footballs and, and right. how much they were inflated or not inflated. One of the big themes that emerges from the, from the film is the issue of media manipulation. And, uh, you know, and, and it plays a role, it seems, in, in the story that you tell. Um, what responsibility do media outlets have to get the facts, the basic facts that they're reporting right on an issue that has such white hot intensity as this did a couple of years ago? Right. Well, and, and even more so on more important issues, I think they probably didn't realize, you know, the, the legs that this story would have when it was initially reported. Obviously, you know, you've got to report on what you know. Um, it is very important to get the facts straight. But in this case, the first information that came out was that 11 of 12 Patriots footballs were two pounds per square inch under the allowable limit. Um, that is a very incendiary piece of information. And that's a tweet by Chris that was, Morton. So. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So what that did, um, it, it, and I, you know, I should say that there was some discounting information. There's a discounting cue there, say, that according to league sources, this is what we're hearing. Now, the 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 issue with this, and this is a very this is a very well used ploy in PR campaigns. So. What happened with that tweet was 11 out of 12, that, that was completely wrong. It was false. There were not more than two PSI below the legal limit. Um, that discounting cue, though, people don't remember. So we talk about, in the movie, we talk about some of these issues, um, cognitive biases. So that if you hear something like 11 of 12 footballs, you remember that part of it, but you don't remember according to league sources, which essentially means well, there will be more information at a later date, mm -hmm. but this is what we're hearing initially. All the sources may or may not be correct or correct. so forth and so on. Right, like. right. So what happens is across the country, you ask someone, you know, they, they can repeat that back to you. 11 of 12 footballs were under 2 PSI. It was, you know, there was clearly cheating here. When in fact that information turns out to be false. It's false information. Cold, this is a hard, cold, false, right? There's it's no ambiguity about this Correct. Anymore. Correct. It's a hard, cold, false. Um, that was that is not the case. It was finally corrected. That piece of information that sat out in the public domain for over a hundred days. So public sentiment really solidified around the fact that the Patriots are cheating. Mm -hmm. It solidified around this false information, which in and of itself played to confirmation bias because Correct. the Patriots have not had a spotless record of playing by the rules. I am a NASCAR fan, as Wayne would appreciate, and there's an old saying in NASCAR that if you're not cheating, you're not trying, <laughs> right? But, but the Patriots had a checkered history about, right, about right, playing right. by the rules. Yes, and do. so when the story comes out that right. the Patriots got caught cheating, right. a lot of people outside of New England went, well, of course. Well, even people inside New England were like, well, even if they did, it wasn't a big deal. So I think that's how, you know, that just demonstrates how powerful this is because People outside New England, yes, of course they were cheating. They're cheaters. Of course they were cheating. We know Tom Brady's a cheater. You know, and anything else that comes out after that, what happens is you, you hear things with a selective ear at that point. Anything that confirms the Patriots are cheaters and confirms, you know, they, they deflate these footballs reinforces your belief. And anything that might challenge your belief, you sort of discard. You really don't pay that much attention to. And so that's how effective PR campaigns really work, right? And, and, and by the way, Deflategate, what you're just talking about, is emblematic of many narratives in and out of right. sports today, maybe more so today than certainly in my memory. So, Absolutely. So this is really illustrative of, of a larger issue in our society. So yeah. science plays a huge role uh, in, in being able to understand what happened and, right. and where, the, where the truth actually stands. So, uh, and, and, and in the film, you actually uh, explore science for hire. So uh, let, let's take this sort of one at a time. Is it, is it reasonable to describe the PR campaign that you're describing as an attack on science? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that one of the reasons that several of the people who were interviewed for the film you know, were so willing to become involved 
was because they, they were really, you know, offended at the attack on the science that this entire scandal really encapsulated. So John Leonard, for instance, MIT professor, huge Eagles fans, hates the Patriots, <laughs> cannot stand them. He, he ended up spending hours and hours and hours reviewing the data. Um, he even did an analysis where he went back through 10,000 NFL games, 10,000 games, and he used the assumptions that we have for that day, 71 degree locker room, if you inflate a football to 12.5 PSI, what will the PSI of that football be out on the field at halftime at that game? And we've got a eureka moment of that. So let's uh, look and listen at a, at a clip here uh, from uh, four games in fall. When they measured the Patriots ball on the sidelines with one of the gauges, guess what they measured? We can look up the, they measured 11.3, okay? Now, instead of thinking ideal gas law, they thought cheating. And everything went downhill from there. So he's talking about something called the ideal gas law, right? Which, uh, which, which says that the, uh, the relationship between the pressure, the volume, and the temperature uh, of a gas are all related. You, in the film, get into the issue of science for hire. Right. What role does science for hire? So this was, this was you know, Professor Leonard was, was uh, animated by this by the pursuit of truth. Uh, there are other people who are animated by the pursuit of something else. What's the role of science for hire in the scandal? Well, so I thought this was a great way to really get people introduced to this concept of science for hire. A lot of people have heard the term, maybe don't necessarily know what it means, maybe don't understand how pervasive it is today. It impacts every aspect of what we put in our bodies, our environment, um, our, just every part of our daily lives is impacted by science for hire. Um, in science for hire, or doubt science, as it's also called, science for sale, is simply um, calling into question, creating doubt around the existing science and um, the knowledge that's out there in the general public about a certain topic. So as a quick example, everybody knows, you know, secondhand smoke causes cancer. We know that, you know, we know that now. Um, but for years, the tobacco industry you know, called, called that into question. They created doubt around it. Well, we don't really know. It may be these other things. You know, we're not really sure. It requires more study. That's an example of doubt science or science for hire. Um, really creating a controversy where it doesn't exist. So another, an example of that would be climate science, mm -hmm. okay? In the 70s and 80s, a lot of people don't know that Exxon was one of the leading edge researchers on climate science. They knew the impact they knew that the, the use of fossil fuels would have a disastrous impact on the, cl on the climate. They had hired wonderful researchers. They had an incredible department of scientists that were really studying this issue. At the end of the 80s, they didn't necessarily make this you know, public, but they, their scientists were doing some very good work. They even published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, at the end of the 80s, they made an about face and they determined that this was an existential threat to their business and so they started seeding um, doubt around climate science. It had widely been, you know, it, it was widely accepted that our use of fossil fuels was, was fueling this climate change. They spent millions and tens of millions of dollars to seed doubt in the public realm around this climate science. So that was actually um, an attack on the existing science without any basis. And you mentioned peer-reviewed journals because one of the th one of the issues that you explore in the film is if you want to bring an academic a, a scientific study into a court of law, it typically needs right. to be in a peer-reviewed journal. Right. And there has been essentially we're not going to name names, but there's been a, a proliferation of uh, right. peer-reviewed journals that maybe aren't to the same level of academic integrity as some of the established right. Uh, right. journals. So, so there are a few different ways that, um, so if, if a corporation is in danger of being regulated or their product is going to be banned or they're facing court cases, for instance, where they're being sued because they've done harm to the environment or an individual, what they will often do, their attorneys will reach out to the science for hire firms. The science for hire firms will either write position papers calling into question, you know, the existing studies saying that there needs to be more work done or they're inconclusive or they're just wrong for some reason, or they'll create studies of their own that really, in, in the science for a higher piece of it is 
they, they want to come to a particular con conclusion, and so they organize the study so that they actually arrive at that conclusion. They can do that in a number of ways. Uh, framing the question that they're going to answer is one way to do it. Um, they can uh, they can manipulate the control group so that so if, for instance this asbestos study in Canada that was done in the 50s um, the researchers were studying the rate of lung cancer among asbestos miners versus the rural population where they lived found a higher incidence of lung cancer so in order to make that disappear they manipulated the control group the control group then included a, an urban area that had a naturally higher incidence of lung cancer. And by doing that, they're able to hide the higher incidence of lung cancer in that minor group. Mm -hmm. So that's a very common uh, tactic as well. Um, they, may, they may do other things as well, but, um, and if the study actually shows that the product causes cancer, does some harm, the company owns that data. They own that study. And so the scientists can't, you know, they, they don't let the scientists typically publish that. Now, once the study is done and it reaches the conclusions that the corporation wants, they can actually um, publish it in a peer-reviewed journal. There are peer-reviewed journals that are known to accept more of this science for hire. They're a little bit more lax in terms of you know, how they evaluate these things. Once a paper, a study goes through the peer review process and is published in one of these journals, it holds extra weight in court. It holds extra weight in for the EPA or the FDA when they're considering, you know, what to do in terms of regulation. Um, so there are a lot of ways that once this gets out into the public domain and becomes that body of research, it impacts the outcome of court cases. It impacts regulation. So it's very, you know, it's very important that we're aware of this because science for hire really um, is utilized in almost every aspect of corporate defense. So I'm sitting here listening to this, and I'm thinking, where is the moral compass of people who are doing this, these scientists for hire? Where is it? This doesn't strike me as anything other than immoral or amoral. Uh, you know, I think that a lot of people would agree with you. And um, first of all, there's a lot of money associated with this. Yeah. There's a lot of prestige in terms of the kinds of work that you can do. Um, it's difficult to say what the motivation is really for doing this sort of work, but it, but it is endemic. It literally encompasses almost every part of our I, lives. I have written about and I know a whole lot of very prominent scientists and not a one of them would do anything like this. The, the whole thought would turn their stomach. So I guess there's another class of so-called scientists who for money are willing to do it. Really, is what it boils down to. It does seem that way. It does seem it that way. It certainly seems that way to me. So you chronicle a number of voices in the, in, the, in the film that talk about the most important thing that the NFL commissioner had to do at the time was protect the integrity of the sport, protect right. the integrity of the league. Um, I'm just curious, after you've, after you've done this research and told the story, how do you think the integrity of the league shook out? Well, for me, you know, on the one hand, you have, you know, Tom Brady who, by all accounts, is a pretty decent guy. I don't know him personally. Um, it doesn't appear that he deflated footballs because there was no deflation. I mean, there just simply wasn't any deflation. On the other hand, you have the league office that, you know, we know starting beginning in the 90s and with this whole concussion issue, they actually structured their own studies, had them published in journals, you know, really um, had a lot of uh, coverage of their studies. We later found out that they had deliberately not included all of the relevant data. That's another way to manipulate mm -hmm. studies. Um, they, you know, had swept a lot of other scandal type things under the rug. Uh, they had not really effectively dealt with their, you know, their employees, the, the players, the players union. Um, they had not effectively dealt with um, issues of domestic violence. So on the one hand, you have this scandal that didn't really happen. And on the other hand, you've got the league office that has demonstra you know, demonstrably been involved in you know, perpetrating some of these things. And so I, you, know, you kind of have to take a step back and look at that. What does that say about the integrity of the game? So was this a distraction? Was the whole I, absolutely. thing a distraction? Yeah, I, I, that, that, was my, that was my theory as I started to kind of delve into this. And I think that, I mean, it's interesting. Why would this go on for two years? This yeah. is, it, it's an absurdity. To anybody who doesn't <laughs> like football, it's, you're, you're like, okay, come on guys, let's, let's move on here. Um, to me, I think it really was ultimately 
a distraction from um, the issues of traumatic brain injury and CTE, these things that are existential threats to the NFL. These are things that, that you know, really could be the end of the NFL as an entity. And so woven through all of this is one word, and the word is money. I would, I would probably have to agree with that, right. Well, let's right. talk about, in the minute that we have left, uh, let's talk about the other money piece in this. So we talked about the integrity of the league. What about the integrity of the broadcast partners? Yeah. Uh, and who, who are business partners with the right. NFL? Right. Well, so that's really interesting. It touches on a whole bunch of different issues. Um, a lot of broadcasters are afraid to upset the NFL because the NFL is a monopoly supplier of the most popular, you know, sport in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, as of now, anyway. As of now, correct. Um, so that 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 is a major issue. You know, I, I think that a lot of people have recognized that we don't get the full story because of that. But I would also say, and someone asked in one of the Q and A's we had at, at a, a film screening. What role do we as individuals play in that? Don't we have to hold them accountable mm. too? And so I think that that's, good you know, question. that really was very good food for thought. I thought it was a very good response. Let's, uh, we got five seconds left. Uh, what are you working on now? Um, actually, I've got a bunch of projects in the works, but at the moment I'm uh, doing a film that explores the relationship between wildlife and humans on Aquidneck Island, Newport, Cliff the Coyote. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, study in biology, and uh, it's, it's, sort of, it's a very fun project. We'll look forward to it. Julie Marin, thank you so much for being with us. She's Julie Marin. The film is Four Games in the Fall. If you can find it, you should see it. Now, that's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.